So now I'm going to this uh, uh, epistemological paradigm and shift of paradigm in time. So we saw the Sankhyayak paradigm where all the faculties were dependent on the manas, on the sense mind, which was interpreting them. It's a scientific paradigm of today. Yeah? There's someone, some brain or some kind of uh, mind, which is interpreting uh, the inputs of senses. It is by the mind we see, by the mind we hear, says Yajnivalke in Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. And that is the essence of Sankhyayak paradigm. In the Vedantic paradigm, these faculties are independent from the mind. In fact, mind is one of those. And manas is not the sense mind only, but has many levels. From the supermind down on every level, supermind, overmind, intuitive mind, and so on. All the levels of the mind up to the physical mind. And the same with the sight. There is the supreme sight. And we saw the faculties uh, and the operations of consciousness, how they are hiding those faculties within the supramental operations, secret operations of the supramental consciousness, four of them. So all of them have gradations. So to say, all the Indriyas as known in Sankhya were in the Vedanta, were treated differently, independently, as the faculties of consciousness. So to say, it was more universal approach to consciousness, where individual was utilizing them, or you, you, individual was rather used by them. He didn't have that strong ahankara to think that it is he who really thinks and chooses for himself. He felt the presence of these faculties much deeper than his ah ahamkara was present. And that's the answer to your question, how do you know, why don't you think that it is you who is doing it? Because there is, a, so to say, a space within you which sees that actually these faculties are not yours. Yours in the terms of ahamkara. It is yours in the, tom, in the terms of um, atman, the self which is one with all other selves, but not in the terms of Ahankara. So that is the Vedantic glimpse. And there is one more shift into the Vedic paradigm, which is even deeper than this. And this is what I will be presenting in the second part. But the shift in that shift, I can clearly show um, on the uh, treatment of the word, how the word was treated in the Veda. And also read to you a few of quotations from Sri Aurobindo, which may explain to you what it means. For example, Sri Aurobindo says, The Veda is not logical. Does not really confute anything. Its method is experiential, intuitional. Its principle is to receive all experiences without systematization and explaining it to the outer mind too much in the systemic, systemic way, as what we do already in Vedanta. All perceptions of truth about the Brahman and either to place them side by side in order of experience and occasional relation, as in the Samhitas, or to arrange them in order of perception and fundamental relation, as in the Upanishads. So you see the distinction. In the Upanishads, there is already a systematization, whereas in the Veda, it's not important. So putting each in its place, correcting misplacement and exaggeration, but not excluding, not destroying, harmony, synthesis, is the law of the Veda. Not discord and a disjection of the members of truth in order to replace the many-sided reality of existence by a narrower logical symmetry. 
of the mind. We are not ready for this knowledge. We are too mental. We need to feed the mind with logical uh, input. But the metaphysical philosophies are compelled by the law of their being to affect precisely this disjunction. Veda can admit two propositions that are logically contradictory. It doesn't matter. Contradictory only logically, but not in reality of experience. So long as they are statements of fundamental experience and perception. It does not get rid of the contradiction by denying experience, but seeks instead the higher truth in which the apparent contradiction is reconciled. So it seeks the truth in which the reconciliation of these apparent contradictions takes place. It doesn't do it by the mind. It doesn't make an order with the mind. It just lifts up the consciousness to see where they are reconciled, on what level it is seen that they both are needed and true. Logic, by its very nature, is intolerant even of apparent contradiction. Its method is verbal, ideative, it accepts words and thoughts as rigid and iron facts instead of what they really are, imperfect symbols and separate sidelights on truth. Being and non-being are ideas opposed to each other, therefore in logic one or the other must ex be excluded. The language of the Shruti is remarkable. For example, he quotes, Asat ekam evadvitiyam Non-being one without a second. Now for the logic it's a, it's a paradox. How can non-being be one without a second? <laughs> and what about being? But there is something else happening with this definition. Eh? And he goes, uh, and shows that the old use of non-being differs from our idea of nothingness. The one cannot be at the same time the many, Therefore, in logic, either the many is an illusion or duality is the fundamental reality of things. Brahman is nirguna, without qualities, beyond definition. Therefore, to the rigid Advaitins, the Saguna Brahman, the infinite personality of God, becomes a supreme myth of Maya, a basic and effective fact indeed, but basic and effective only in and of the grand cosmic illusion which it directs. The battle is finally a civil strife between Vedantist and Vedantist, temporarily victorious over rival schools. They turn to rend each other but the strive is still mainly about fundamental perception. The great question now is the fundamental unity or difference between the supreme soul and the individual or another, which would have astonished greatly the ancient rishis. The question whether the world is false or real. It would have astonished greatly the ancient rishis, this question, whether the world is false or real. False not only in its appearance, sorry, appearance to the senses, but per se, in itself, in its essence and its being. Thus it has come down to our own age, ever narrowing more and more, shorn of its victorious streams, awaiting its return to a wider flood and a more grandiose motion. So you can see how this 
huge ocean comes down to narrow and narrow and narrower streams of our thought and systematization awaiting its return to a wider flood. So awaiting. What is that awaiting? What does it really do? Why it was necessary to narrow consciousness down to that? So that is the, the whole vision of the Veda and the Vedic knowledge of these cycles starting Manvantaras, starting from Satya Yuga and narrowing down to Kali Yuga. What is really happening within that cycle? Why, do, why are we born uh, young and uh, n you know, fresh and uh, naive and innocent and then we grow old and become very stiff and finally we cannot go on anymore and we have to drop our body? Why this takes place, this narrowing down constantly from a wider vision to the more narrow vision? This is the, the whole secret of our life here. These yugas, 